Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a challenging one entitled Preparation for the End Time. This is lesson number three in that series entitled, for April 21 of 2018, entitled Jesus and the Book of Revelation. That should prove to be very interesting. So, before we begin, we'd like to ask you to join us in, in a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, it's as a privilege to, for us to turn now to your word, to learn it what we can from these very important words. We have always told ourselves as a Seventh-day Adventist church that we are nearing the end of time. What could that mean? How do we prepare ourselves? May we learn from this series of lessons some important ways in which we can prepare ourselves is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the book of Revelation, I don't think I need to tell. Certainly nobody who spent any amount of time reading it is full of symbolism, mysterious creatures, many references, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, that are taken from the Old Testament. Uh, there are, of course, other books in the New Testament that refer to the Old Testament, and Jesus himself referred many times to the Old Testament. Now, sometimes people who are not quite so familiar with the chronology and so forth of the Bible look at when Jesus quotes Scripture, they think, oh, well, he must be quoting somewhere between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The New Testament had not been written yet when Jesus was speaking. So when he talks about Scripture or the Bible or the Word, or sometimes he'll say the Law and the Prophets, he's talking about the Old Testament. And there's many references for that. Uh, we would really encourage you to have, take your, your computer and look at the internet. Look at our handouts on these, these uh, particular lessons because there's lots of references there that we will not have time to touch on. Anyway, it is virtually impossible to read the book of Revelation and understand it without a fairly good knowledge of the Old Testament symbolism is particularly closely related to the book of Daniel. That is why we often study those two books together. And we'll see there are a number of reasons why Daniel is parallel to Revelation. So Revelation starts out, interestingly enough, this book is the record of the events that Jesus Christ revealed. Jesus Christ revealed. God gave him this revelation in order to show his servants what must happen very soon. Christ made these things known to his servant John by sending his angel to him. Um, I wish we knew for sure exactly uh, the story of exactly how it was revealed to John and under what circumstances I had the privilege a couple of years ago of actually visiting the Isle of Patmos and they took us to a cave on the side of the mountain. They said, well, this is where it happened. Well, maybe so. I just don't know for sure. I have some pictures of that very interesting cave, but... Uh, Anyway, it says God revealed it to Jesus and Jesus revealed it to John. Much of the book of Revelation has to do with events scattered in the future from Jesus' day all the way to the end of the world, including even the third coming of Jesus and the, and the millennium that comes between the second and the third comings. And we know, those of us who spent some time with the book of Revelation, that for whatever reason, God did not choose to reveal the information about the millennium and the third coming to any of the other disciples or anyone in the Old Testament. So that means only the, God, only the prophet Daniel, the, the disciple Daniel, the apostle Daniel, I'm sorry, I'm saying Daniel, I mean John. Only apostle John, the disciple John, was the only one who knew about the millennium and the third coming. But we'll uh, get to that. Well, eventually. of course, Paul said he was taken to the third heaven, was shown things that a man is not uh, allowed to reveal or mm -hmm. able to reveal or something. We don't know what that w was. Yeah. So he, he well, may have had some ideas. Ideas. Some of the stuff he says in his letters, you say, well, come on, give me a little more of this. This yeah. is not, <laughs> doesn't flesh it out very well. Yeah. But, uh, so well, he, he probably knew more. Even in the Old Testament, for example, in the book of Zechariah, there are things that we now know apply to the third coming. But there's no hint in Zechariah that it's talking about a third coming. Well, critical scholars have done terrible things with the book of Revelation. 
look at some of their comments. We will in a moment. First of all, because they do not believe that even God can predict the future. So if you don't believe the Revelation can predict the future, they try to make the book of Revelation all about a pagan resurgence or resurrection of the, wor of the worship of Nero as a god. Remember that Nero claimed to be a god even while he was alive, then he died at a fairly young age. And for a little while there was a, a group of people, particularly in the area what we now call Turkey, that, that prayed and believed that he was going to come back. And so they say, ha ha, now we know the book of Revelation is talking about the resurgence, the coming back of Nero, back from the dead which most of us as Christians have never heard of. Of course, they also don't believe in the existence of a personal devil. Therefore, they do not admit anything like a cosmic conflict or a great controversy. Well, with that background, they see the book of Revelation as a book about God's retributive revenge against his enemies. Some regard the Holocaust against the Jews as the time, at the time of World War II as proof that God no longer cares about what happens on planet Earth. So uh, you're going to give us a little feel for what some of those people have said. Um, Fred, you want to? Yeah, Martin Luther in 1522 is famous for his statements about the book of Revelation. For example, he said, I miss more than one thing in this book. It makes me consider it to be neither apostolic nor prophetic. My spirit cannot accommodate itself to this book. For me, this is reason enough not to think highly of it. Christ is neither taught nor known in it. Wow. Then there are other scholars, so-called scholars, who have said a few very interesting things about the book of Revelation. Here they are. Revelation is a hideous version of Christianity. It is repulsive work. Then another one said uh, resentment and uh, not love is the teaching and the revelation of St. John the Divine. Another one yet said uh, revelation is a book without wisdom, goodness, kindness, or affection of any kind. Wow. Yet another one said what we find in Revelation is a projection into the future of what was unfulfilled in the past. Jesus did not destroy the wicked in this earthly life, but he would return with supernatural power to complete the task. <laughs> that's, that's amazing how anyone could say that. Just Yet another one said, we are bound to judge that in the conception of the character of God and his attitudes to man, the book falls below the level, not only of the teachings of Jesus, but of the best part of the Old Testament. Yet another author said, um, in the popular view, apocalypse is about cat cataclysms, death and destruction. Another author, God's covenant curses on the enemies. Yet another one said the primary focus is on punitive judgment. And we're last going to give one more, righteous judgment and vengeance upon those who viciously harassed and oppressed the faithful. Now, after all those quotes, you sure we want to go on and study this book? <laughs> Some people uh, would say, if it's good enough for these scholars, it's good enough for me. Yeah. Well, I, I put this collection together. I have chosen not to mention the names of these scholars because um, we don't believe that idea. He, these are actual quotes from some, and, and, and unfortunately, some of the even Adventist scholars. The exception, of course, is the name of Martin Luther because his quotation is so widely known. How incredibly different are these views from the views of those of us who believe in the great controversy, trust, healing model of the plan of salvation. Aren't you glad that we have a nicer God, nicer picture of, love, of a God of love, a picture based on reading all the 66 books of the Bible? So Ellen White painted a very different picture than, the, than do the above scholars. And Dennis, I think you've got that one. The whole Bible is a revelation. For all revelation to men comes through Christ, and all centers in Him. God has spoken unto us by His Son, whose we are by creation and by redemption. 
Christ came to John exiled on the Isle of Patmos to give him the truth for these last days, to show him that, w that which must shortly come to pass. Jesus Christ is the great trustee of divine revelation. It is through him that we have a knowledge of what we are to look for in the closing scenes of this earth's history. God gave his, this revelation to Christ, and Christ communicated the same to John. Now that doesn't sound like any repulsive picture of God, does it? No. Go ahead. John, the beloved disciple, was the one chosen to receive this revelation. He was the last survivor of the first chosen disciples. Under the New Testament dispensation, he was honored as the prophet Daniel was honored under the Old Testament dispensation. The instruction to be communicated to John was so important that Christ came from heaven to give it to his servant, telling him to send it to the churches. This instruction is to be the object of our careful and prayerful study. For we are living in a time when men who are not under the teaching of the Holy Spirit will bring in false theories. These men have been standing in high places and they have ambitious projects to carry out. They seek to exalt themselves and to revolutionize the whole show, showing of things. God has given us special instruction to guard against such ones. He bade John write in a book that which should take place in the closing scenes of this earth's history. Uh, manuscript 129-1905 in the seventh volume of the Bible Com SDA Bible Commentary, 953. Okay, well, that was a fairly lengthy quotation there, but it's very clear that Ellen White felt very strongly that here was a, here's a, a, a message that was very important for people living from John's day to our day, and that it was given by God to Christ and Christ to John. And so important that John him, I mean that Christ himself came down to reveal this to his friend John. So, both the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation are divided into two basic sections. A historical section and an eschatological section dealing with end time events. What does eschatological mean? End time. End of time. Okay, eschatos in Greek means last things, the end. So eschatological would be study of the last things. But even historical sections give us hints about things that will likely happen at the end of this world's history. Thus, the Old Testament history gives us some hints about what is coming in the future. So, how is that? What, what, what things come from the historical part of the book of, of Daniel that refer to end times? Can you think of something right off, right off, your, off the top of your head? You mean the prophecies? Well, 2300 days. one example is, yeah, well, but that, that would be the, the second Daniel. section. Mm -hmm. But even in the first section, there's, the sec the, there's Daniel 2, isn't there? Daniel 2. And yeah. it goes all the way through to the rock coming, being cut out of the mountain and destroying and so forth. So even in the, and of course, uh, that means that it's, you know, the, when the kingdom of God comes, it's going to wipe out all the earthly kingdoms. And we don't know how much that's going to precede the actual appearing, but... Uh, a hints that there could be some disaster things coming up. Well, there's a many passages in the New Testament suggested that we should learn from the Old Testament. One very important passage, and I'm going to read it in some detail here, it's 1 Corinthians 10. I want you to remember, my brothers and sisters, what happened to our ancestors who followed Moses. They were all under the protection of the cloud, and all passed safely through the Red Sea. In the cloud and in the sea, they were all baptized as followers of Moses, all ate the same spiritual bread and drank the same spiritual drink. They drank, drank from the spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was Christ himself. But even then, God was not pleased with most of them, and so their dead bodies were scattered over the desert. Now, all this is an example for us to warn us not to desire evil things as they did, nor to worship idols as some of them did. As the scripture says, the people sat down to a feast which turned into an orgy of drinking and sex. And what's he, talk, what's he talking about there? The golden, golden calf. calf experience. The golden calf experience at the, right at the foot of Mount Sinai. And, and there's God's presence at the top of the mountain right over them. I mean, I, it, this just blows me away when I think about it, you know. And I've climbed that mountain. It's 
not that far. You can climb the mountain from the foot to the top in about three or four hours, uh, and it's pretty steep. But we must not be guilty of sexual immorality as some of them were, and one day 23,000 of them fell dead. And what, what reference is that to? The women that were in, induced by Balaam's prophecy, or yeah. Balaam's suggestions to the kings. Yep. So just before they entered the, pro the promised land, we must not put the Lord to the test as some of them did, and they were killed by snakes. And that's, of course, in their experience out there in, the, in the Deuteronomy 8 and back in Numbers also. We must not complain as some of them did, and they were destroyed by the angel of death. All these things happen to them as examples for others, and they're written down as a warning for us, for we live at a time when the end is about to come. So, is it true that these things are specifically intended as a warning for us in our day? What happened to Daniel and his book when he was finished with it? Sealed. Seal it up. So he said, there's going to be a while until you understand this completely, right? Well, what can we learn about the stories in Daniel 3? What's, what's the story of Daniel 3? What happened in Daniel 3? Uh, the golden image and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were the plain of to Dura. Right, and the plain of Dura, exactly. And they stood up and said, we will not bow down to your idol. And they were thrown into that burning, fiery furnace. And they did just fine in there. I thought it was well air-conditioned, huh? And then Daniel 6. What happened in Daniel 6? The lion's den. Okay. You might have parallels at the end of time. Is Can you think about how the golden statue and the lion's den might have some parallels with end times? Worship, uh, standing for truth. Uh, you, you, either, you either, does this sound familiar? You either worship what I tell you to at the time I tell you to or off with your head. And where some do, will be miraculously spared. Where do we read about that in the New Testament? In the book of Revelation, to be precise. Revelation 13. Not exactly yeah, if you don't... buy or sell unless you, you be have able, the mark of the Yeah, beast. exactly. Yeah. Well, Revelation focuses a lot of its, its efforts on, on what's going to come in the future. And it suggests that it will be worse than anything that has happened in the past. Fortunately, we're assured that ultimately God's cause will be vicious. I have been listening to some... Victorious. Victorious, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Victorious. I've been listening to some passages from Ellen White, some uh, books from Ellen White, as I run in the mornings, and she has some pretty stark things to say about what's going to happen at the end of time. Revelation is divided between the historical portion in Revelation 1 through 11 and the end time portion of Revelation 13 to 22. So, what happens in Revelation 12? Where does it go? In the middle. Is it historical or is it prophetic? Oh. What? War in heaven? Yeah. It's historical, it's, but it's also present. Yeah, so it's a bridge, isn't it? Yeah. It covers all the way from the very beginning of the great controversy, the beginning of the rebellion of sin, all the way down to the final events connected with God's church at the end of time. Well, um, and it talks about particularly about the dragon fighting against God's church. Once again, we are reminded of the incredible battles which are key events in the great controversy and just very briefly, because we don't have a lot of time, what are the key battles that just pop up in your head when you think about the great controversy? What was the first big battle? Lucifer against God. The battle in heaven. What was the next big battle? Battle in Eden. Adam, Adam and Eve. Yeah, Adam and Eve. The next big battle? Huge battle that affects all of us. Uh, not so many people involved, but really critical battle. And that, of course, was the time of Jesus. And all everything that Satan did to try to attack him and get that all done. And then the what we sometimes call the final big battle will be when? Armageddon. Armageddon, which apparently is split between what happens before the second coming and what happens before the third coming. But that's a, that's a discussion for later. Well, and as we suggested before, sometimes the devil thinks he's winning and sometimes he clearly didn't win. 
Well, and then after 4,000 years of human history, God sent his son as a helpless baby boy into the heart of the devil's territory here on planet Earth to win the great controversy. I mean, can you think anything of anything less intuitive than that? God says, okay, I'm at war with devil. Devil claims this planet is his. So what does God do? He sends a helpless baby boy right in the middle, right into the middle of, you know, this is not like some trained spy that's come to <laughs> invade the forces. It's a baby boy, you know? Amazing. Well, um, could there be any greater contrast between good and evil? So what have we learned by studying the history of the great controversy? I hope it will never be said, and unfortunately it has been, that Adventists are no better than others in the world who learn from history that we do what? Don't learn from history. Don't learn we from don't learn anything from history. So now, scanning through the book of Revelation, you'll discover that Jesus is described by many different names and descriptions in the book of, of Revelation. For example, in Revelation 1, 5, 18, so forth, I'm going to read just a few of the descriptions there. He's called the faithful witness. He's called the first to be raised from death and who is also the ruler of the kings of the world. He is the living one who has authority over death and the world of the dead. He is the lamb. He is the faithful and true. He's the one who judges and fights his battles. His eyes were like a flaming fire. He wore many crowns on his head. He has a name written on him. No one except himself knows what it is, but a little bit later it says a portion of that name anyway, anyway will be the word of God. Um, get to the right place here. He's followed by the armies of heaven. Out of his mouth came a sharp sword. He will defeat the nations. He will rule over them with a rod of iron. He will trample out the wine and the winepress of the furious anger of the Almighty God. And finally, he will be King of kings and Lord of lords. Wow. Okay, so, Gordon, I think you're up next. From the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Monday, there are only a few of the many texts in Revelation that depict Jesus in various roles and functions. He is the Lamb, which points to the first coming, in which he offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. He was also the one who was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, Revelation 1, 18. A clear reference to his death and resurrection from the dead. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, Luke 24, 46. Finally, in Revelation 19, 11 through 15, he is depicted in his role at the second coming when he will return to the earth in power and glory and judgment. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works, Matthew 16, 27. I'd like to just insert a little bit, a little note there. I've heard times in the past when Adventists have had big discussions going on about how you'll know whether it's a false Christ or whether it's a true Christ at the end. I've even heard people say, well, watch his feet. Mm -hmm. If they touch the ground, he's a fake. You don't need to bother with that. I'll, t I'll give you the clue that Ellen White focuses on, which the Bible focuses on. When Jesus shows up, the real Jesus shows up, the entire sky is going to be full of bright, shiny angels. Nobody else is going to be able to do that. So if you don't see a angels covering the sky, it's a phony. Okay. So what about this now? Do we make or could we make the life, death, resurrection, and return of Jesus a central focus in our lives? What would happen if we did that? Well, we must be born again. So the life, death, and resurrection is, is personal the experience, the personal experience that we all should have. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. How do you do that in a 
in the kind of world, I mean, I was just mentioning a little bit earlier that at work today, I mentioned something about the Bible and one of the nurses I have been working with, this is a, this is a place where it's not an Adventist place, um, a federally qualified health center as we call it. One of the worst nurses that I've been working with very closely for some time now said, I opened the Bible once and I couldn't make sense of, it, but couldn't make heads or tails of it, so I put it down. I've ne I know nothing at all about the Bible. What are we going to do? How are we going to reach people like that? They don't have preconceived ill ideas about uh, about the Bible. <laughs> Maybe that's a plus, huh? It is a plus. Well, if you opened a book on calculus or yeah. on, uh, you know. It, it, uh, graduate biology and you tried to make sense of it, that but doesn't mean it isn't of value, it just means you need to start with some of the simpler things. That's why there's stories and uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah. so the fact that it's, it's, there are complexities just shows uh, its divine origin, I think. I have another patient, and excuse me for mentioning my own personal experiences, I have another patient I've been seeing for a long time, and uh, she's a woman who's, uh, she must be close to 50 now, she's still trying to go to college, still trying to get a degree, and so she can go out and find herself a good job. Well, today, for the first time, she brought her daughter in, and the daughter's pregnant, and that was the whole thing. But turns out, I said, so I said to her, I said, are you working? Are you going to school? What are you doing? And she says, oh, I'm, I'm going to school, but I also work as, a, as an t assistant to one of the professors, so her job is at the school. I says, what are you studying? She says, I'm studying math. Mm. Um, you know, you usually don't see women studying math. You know, you can just see her sort of light up. I said, just jokingly, I said, well, what do you think of differential equations? Oh, I love differential equations. Whoa! <laughs> you know, most people, differential equations, what in the world is that? But it just, just shows you that, you know, people, people are really up on what, they're, what they like, what they, what they think is important. But don't you think that too many people read the stories in the Bible, and many of them don't seem to make sense? Yeah. And they're not really looking for the message of those stories? As a result of it, you are left with a story, and so what? Mm -hmm. Big deal, you know? But it's, it's like kids' stories, a bunch yeah. of kids' stories. Yeah. And they, what we need to see is the, is the link behind all of them. All these stories are there for a reason. They teach us something very important about God. Well, one other interesting little sidelight, if you will, or maybe not such a sidelight, a, one a central motif in the book of Revelation is the fact that it focuses on the sanctuary. Focuses on the sanctuary? How does the book of Revelation focus on the sanctuary? Well, uh, if you read carefully, it's obvious. If you don't read carefully, you would miss it completely. But when we see Jesus in chapter 1, where is he standing? Amongst the lampstands. Among the lampstands. And which lampstands are these? The holy place. This would be a reference to the holy place. And you, you go on through, you see as each time there's a new message, there's some reference to some part of the, the temple, the sanctuary, the Old Testament sanctuary, through it until he finally sees, all of a sudden, the curtain opens and he sees what? The Ark, Ark of, the, of covenant. the Covenant. Yeah, so he's progressing through the sanctuary from the Old Testament as he, as he moves on here. Well, look at Revelation 4, 1 and 2. At this point, I had another vision, saw an open door in heaven, and the voice that sounded like a trumpet, which I had heard speaking to me before, said, Come up here and I will show you what, you what must happen after this. At once the Spirit took control of me. There in heaven was a throne with someone sitting on it. And um, who sits on the throne in heaven? Father. God, the Father. So what's being pictured in these verses? Throne room of God. Yeah, exactly. And do we have other references to it in the Bible? For example, Hebrews 10, just one. Christ, however, offered one sacrifice for sins, an offering that is effective forever, and then he sat down at the right hand side of God. There he now waits until God puts his enemies as a footstool under his feet. With one sacrifice, then he has made perfect forever those who are purified from 
sin. Okay. Ezekiel's vision, yeah, uh, which portrayed God's throne as mobile, which conveyed the message that God wasn't stuck over there in Jerusalem, that, right. and they weren't isolated over here. God can come to them and, and meet their needs where they were. I mean, you could see that it would be a terrible stress for people, the, for the Hebrew people, because most of the people in the ancient world believed that each of the gods, the many gods they thought existed, was assigned to certain territory. So what happens if you're praying to Yahweh, your God, and all of a sudden you're taken as a prisoner to Babylon? And Yahweh is not over there. Did the something. Jews believe that, or was that the other nations that Some believed that? Some of them believed that. Well, the point of the sanctuary, though, is that it is the repository of the Word of God. Exactly. Wherever you are and you have the Word of God, you have the sanctuary of God. Mm -hmm. and, and clearly, you know, Daniel proved and others proved that God is just as present in Babylon as, it is, as he was in, in Canaan, in right. Palestine. So they got that me me message figured out pretty quickly. So but we some of the some of the captives may have been corrupted by those the taunts of those around them uh, with that yeah. idea and so yeah. Ezekiel's vision and his prophecies were to encourage them very appropriate mm -hmm. exactly yeah Babylon was the New York of that time yeah. and a lot of people chose to stay in New York rather than to go to a deserted city of Jerusalem, where even the temple had to be rebuilt. Yeah, it was just a pile of rubble at that yeah. point in time. Well, we need to recognize, of course, that this is not about location, the, whether the holy place or most holy place. Some people have gotten all hung up on whether Jesus is in the holy place and his father's, I mean, in the holy place and his father's in the most holy place, and how does that work out? I mean, the point is, any place where God is is the most holy place. What we're talking about here when we talk about the holy place and the most holy place, we're talking about the function of what's going on. This is a, this is a description of what's going on at that time in, in history, and we don't have time to go into all that now. But. And then finally we come to Revelation 11:19, talking about this um, thing. God's temple in heaven was opened and the covenant box was seen there. Then there were flashes, and the covenant, covenant box is a, a modern term for the ark. Then there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. And what do all those things represent? God's presence, huh? We, we've seen that several times. So John saw the ark there in the most holy place. Could this be, by the way, um, and I just mentioned this here in, in the handout, what happened at the moment when Jesus, when Jesus died? The veil was, was rent between the, the veil of the temple. temple. I mean, this was Passover. This was the, mo the one of the key events of that whole week. And as many people as possible were crowded there into the temple watching what the priest is doing. And he's over there just getting ready to sacrifice the lamb. And Ellen White says, all of a sudden, they could see that, the, 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 see, this is the opening into, they were looking through one curtain and they were looking to, into, through another curtain in there. And all of a sudden, they could see that heavy veil just ripping from top to bottom. And what did they see inside of there? Well, the there wouldn't have been anything there. Because there was a bare rock. There was nothing there because... Jeremiah hid it. Jeremiah hid the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So all of a sudden, they realize God's presence isn't there anymore. Of course, they knew that. They knew that, didn't they? They are just... I wonder, I wonder, I doubt that the, the Sadducees or maybe even the Pharisees would be very open with the idea that the Ark of the Covenant isn't there anymore. Maybe. Yeah, it was symbolically, God is no longer with you. He's yeah. not even there. Mm -hmm. So what do we have to do? Look at the holy place as the place where there is that transition back to God. It's a process to get back to Him. And there are several things that are happening there in the holy place that will ultimately lead you to understand the most holy place. Yeah. Well, these references suggest that there are two different aspects to the ministry of Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Ellen White reminded us that. Myra? 
All heaven is engaged in the work of preparing the people to stand in the day of the in the day of the Lord's preparation. The connection of heaven with earth seems very close. Ellen White, letter 45 in 1892. Okay, is it fair then to say that every aspect of the book of Revelation is intended to be a revelation of Jesus Christ? Sure. I think so. Sure. Surely God would not call it a revelation of Jesus Christ if it is a sealed or shut book, as many claim. Read again Revelation 1, 1 to 8. We'll get to that in a moment. Jesus made it very clear in these verses that he is revealing the truth to us through John, and, he, and particularly that he is coming back. The fact that Jesus himself came down to reveal this information to John while he was in exile on the Isle of Patmos makes it very clear to us that God is in, intimately involved in everything that happens on this earth. And then that famous verse that many people know, Revelation 1, verse 7, Look, he's coming in the clouds. Everyone will see him, including those who pierced him. All peoples on earth will mourn over him. So shall it be. And that's, of course, the event I was talking about earlier. And the entire sky will be full of bright, shining angels. One of the most precious promises in the entire Bible. Okay, so look at Revelation 1, 12 to 18, and Jim, I think you have that. I turned round to see who was talking to me, and I saw seven gold lampstands, and among them there was that, there was what looked like a human being wearing a robe that reached to his feet, and a gold belt round his chest. His hair was white as wool, or as snow, and his eyes blazed like fire. His feet shone like brass, that he has been refined and polished, and his voice sounded like a roaring waterfall. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came out of his mouth. His face was as bright as the midday sun. When I saw him, I fell down at, the excuse me, I fell down at his feet like a dead man. He placed his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, but now I am alive forever and ever. I have authority over death and the world of the dead. So he told him, stand up, and I want to talk to you. And that's, that's what God always says to the people who... who uh, and can we give some examples of that, even from the Old Testament? Can you think Why of, is it described here, though, that he's got this two-edged... Well, I was going to ask, that was my next question. Yeah, I'm asking you. <laughs> okay. So why would God be described as having a sword coming out of his mouth and it's sharper? I mean, who than... wouldn't be afraid? They'd yeah. fall down and go, you know. But what well, comes somebody... out of his mouth is a message. Mm -hmm. And the message as a sword, sword divides things. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yes. it, 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 it's, it's that information is coming. Jesus speaks and uh, you make a decision. You choose, you judge, you, you, you judge yourself. There's a separation that takes place because of the sword. Some are goats and remain goats, others are goats who become lamb-like. That's mm -hmm. a separation of the lambs and the goats. There's also the sword that hits all the way down to the... The, the marrow. The marrow well, itself. Let me read that. Yeah. This is the verse I think of Hebrews 4.12. The Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. There's your double-edged sword. The Word of God, it cuts all the way through to where soul and spirit meet, to where joints and marrow come together. It judges the desires and thoughts of the heart. So the idea is that God's Word, what comes out of His mouth, judges us based on our motives, our thoughts, our words, there's, 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 I think we have to be careful with this word judge as it's transla translated there because really separate. Yeah, it sure. separates good from evil. <laughs> That's what it helps us do. That yeah, sword right. is all about that. I, I would see more in, in soul and spirit. The source of the uh, soul would be the action, the activity. Spirit would be where that activity, what, what is uh, guiding or directing or giving rise to that action. So there might be 
good a what she thought were good actions, like the disciples who said, mm -hmm. you know, Elijah did this. Why don't we just call down fire out of heaven? And Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of. That's right. Right. Mm -hmm. So you don't know what's driving these actions. So uh, part of, you know, I'll go back to judgment, but discernment is, is looking at not just at the action, but where, where did that come from? What's giving rise? Is it God that, God's spirit that's driving it, or is it Okay, and to support else? what both of you have said, look for a moment at John, the Gospel of John. Now, not John's revelation in Revelation, but the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 6, 17, starting right after the famous verse in John three sixteen, For God did not send his Son into the world to be its judge, Fred, but to be its Savior. Those who believe in the Son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged because they have not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. All those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to light because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was in obedience to God. So what's the judge real? What's the actual judging agent? The truth. The words, the words of truth. The words of truth. Only the truth can help us. Yeah. And the, a God. And I, where I, does the truth, to, for, for my sake, where does the truth come from? Right out of the mouth of God, right? Well, and that's what this whole book is about, is yeah. a bunch of uh, uh, words. Uh, but our job is to teach, educate uh, people. Uh, they may not get it just by having the book on their ho shelf at home. See, they need to spend some time with some people that can help them. Can you think of some other people in the Old Testament, for example, who fell on their faces when an angel or God appeared before them? Moses did. Okay. At the burning bush. At the burning bush. Anybody else? Um, well, well, Daniel. No. Well, Daniel did in, in Daniel 9 as he's praying and so forth there. Yeah? Yeah. Anytime an angel or an, I mean, if so, uh, somebody, a supernatural being suddenly appeared in this room, you know, we wouldn't say, oh, hey, <laughs> no. oh, have a seat. You know, it would be startling. You know, you would. Yeah. And in their, they're thinking this is, this is God showing up, yeah. you know, even if it were. In Joshua 5, verse 14, Joshua has that experience. In Ezekiel 1, 28, Ezekiel has this experience. So it's, uh, it, it happens quite a few times there in, in the Old Testament. And the first thing the angel has to say is, fear not. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, think, of, think about another thing that, that we're talking about here. Jesus delayed his arrival at Bethany when he was here on this earth until Lazarus had been dead for four days. He did that on purpose because in those days it was believed by many people that the Spirit hovered around the grave for three more days just in case there was some kind of resuscitation. But after four days, everybody agreed, no chance the guy is dead. And what did Martha say? He stinks. Don't take the, roll, the stone away. He smells, right? So that three days was really because they had a hard time figuring out for sure when someone was dead. Yeah, exactly. They didn't have our modern technology. Exactly, yeah. And sometimes we're wrong. So, John 11, 25 and 26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in, the will, believe in me will live even though they die. And those who live and believe in me will never die. Do you believe this? Well, lo and behold, it turns out that that same message is repeated in Revelation 22, 7 and 12 and 13. So there we have a note, I think, Fred, that's yours, Christ Jesus? Uh, the, in the Revelation? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, in the Revelation, the statement by Ellen White, I portrayed the deep things of God. The very name given to its inspired pages, the Revelation, contradicts the statement that this is a sealed book. A revelation is somewhat revealed, or something revealed. The Lord himself reveals to his servants the mysteries con contained in this book, and he designs that they shall be open to the study of all. His truths are addressed to those living in the last days of the earth's history, as well as to those living in the days of John. 
Some of the scenes depicted in this prophecy are in the past. Some are taking place. Some bring to view the close of the great conflict between the powers of darkness and the Prince of Heaven. And some reveal the truths of joy, the redeemed in the earth made new. This is Ellen White, Acts of the Apostles, 584. And I jumped over a passage there that I wanted to read. Christ Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the genesis of the Old Testament and the revelation of the New. Both meet together in Christ. Adam and God are reconciled by the obedience of the second Adam, who accomplished the work of overcoming the temptations of Satan and redeeming Adam's disgraceful failure and fall. That's SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 6, 1092 and 1093. So, We've already seen a number of passages in the book of Revelation referring to Jesus and telling us different aspects of his ministry. For more references to that, and that's the handout, so if you want to get those additional references, uh, look at our website at www.theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, theox dot O-R-G, and you'll be able to see all that. You can see it on the screen right now. So why do you think there are so many references in the New Testament to, to uh, messages and stories uh, and ideas from the Old Testament? Well, that's what they considered scripture. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, and Paul said that the Jews were, it was their privilege and their job to preserve those, those writings, the oracles of God. So they were looked at as very important. Sure. I mean, this was the, yeah, the, you know, the words of God to them. The Jews at one point in time, that was about all they had left to, to claim as ma that makes them a distinctive people. Yeah, and that's probably why Jesus had to come back there in this mm -hmm. world, because they were the only ones on the planet who had this book of revelations mm -hmm. through the, in the New Testament, the revelations from God. Right. Well, in the early centuries after Jesus returned to heaven and Jerusalem was destroyed, there was a great battle between the Jews and the Christians. And what was that battle about? Well, very few Jews could still read the ancient Hebrew. And so they did, most of them depended upon Greek. That was, the, that was the common language that was used by everybody at that point in time. And what was the name of the Greek translation of the scriptures? Septuagint. The Septuagint. So the Jews wanted the Septuagint to be preserved by them as their history. They wanted, okay, what we would call the Old Testament, they said, this is our historical book, it tells about us, so we're the ones who have the right to decide how it should be interpreted, what it should say, and so forth. And what did the Christians say? The Christians said, nothing doing. This Old Testament book is only half of the story, it fits with the other half of the story, which is the New Testament. So things predicted in the Old Testament are fulfilled in the New Testament, and you have to see that connection in order to get the full picture, so that you can't have the, the Old Testament standing alone as some kind of history, Jewish history, and the New Testament standing over here by itself. That just never worked. And who won that battle? Well, in a sense, they both did. Okay. <laughs> the uh, Christians got the Septuagint, and the Jews went back to the Hebrew. Yeah. The Jews went back to the Hebrew and started preserving it very carefully because that's what they had left. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, the Jews, of course, greatly outnumbered the Jews within a couple hundred years after the time of Christ. And of course, by 300 AD, what happened? Christianity was the, the declared the, the official religion. religion of the Roman Empire, wasn't it? So, as you look, those of you who have some experience with Scripture, do you see a very clear relationship between Daniel and Revelation? Can you think of one or two clear links between Daniel and Revelation? Anybody? Well, the 1260 days. Yeah. Uh, exactly. It's referred to in, in a variety of ways, but it still adds up to. Uh, you know, it's it's 1260 days, and it's 42 months, and it's three and a half years, and they're mentioned in yeah. both Daniel and Revelation. Yeah, exactly. Um, anything else you want to, that you would, 
we've already mentioned the fact that Daniel has a historical part and a prophetic part, and Revelation has a historical part and a prophetic part, and if we had time here, we would mention many other ways in which those, um, those two books are, are related. Um, there's some interesting things in a little more depth I'd take, like to take just a moment to mention. The scholars have suggested that John, even though he was writing in Greek, and the Revelation is not very polished Greek, uh, it's, it's kind of rough, and some people say, well, that's because it wasn't his first language. Um, but they would suggest that while John was writing in Greek, he was really doing his thinking in, in Hebrew. So if we, if, we, if we accept that idea, we, would, we notice that in chapter 1 he talks about reading and hearing and keeping. The Hebrew word for hear has a double meaning. Remember that Revelation was written in Greek, and we think that John was thinking in Hebrew. The Hebrew verb hear, as in with your ears, means to understand. Uh, for example, in 1 Kings 3, 9, Nehemiah 8, 3, Revelation 2, 7. This is not just a casual reading. It means we are to search until we understand it. But the Hebrew word goes even deeper. It also means to obey. Are we willing to follow our understanding with our obedience? Well, it's interesting to notice that in, in, in that chapter also, the, the verb read is in the singular in the Greek, while the other two verbs that follow are in the plural. Why would that be? There's one person who's reading it to the group. Most people didn't read in those days, and yeah. even less common than reading was the ability to have Scripture. Okay, and what do you mean by that? Well, it was very expensive. It was hand-written. It was uh, only a few copies were available. A scroll that had been written by Paul, I mean, in this case, John, and sent to the churches would have been very expensive, very expensive to produce. And so when it shows up at a church, and you know, you just throw it open and let everybody who just looks there, first of all, like as Gordon has already mentioned, very few of them can read, could read. So probably the leader of the church would be the one who was able to read. He would stand up and carefully read it. Try to imagine yourself hearing the book of Revelation from beginning to end without stopping. How much do you think you would get? <laughs> so first, would, first time through, not much. No, probably not. Well, um, and, and yet they, they must have gotten some, a lot out of it. So, I'm sure they went back. They went back over it. They went back over it. And, We've already suggested on a number of occasions there were people with mammoth memories. It was, they were very good at memorizing. They would, they would, there are people who memorize the entire Old Testament in Hebrew. So I'm sure that they would hear this and they would, you know, their, their minds weren't full of sound bites and uh, entertainment and movies and news and crazy things going on in the world around us. Well, what have we learned here in these, this lesson? It's very easy. Well, and just, just a point that we might learn from that point, that illustration. The book of Revelation is not to be read alone. How many people have read, sat down with the book of Revelation and parsed it and parsed it and, and come up with some wild, crazy ideas? Um, it's better to, when you're studying the book of Revelation to to do it with a group, do it with some other people. So if you come up with some far out idea, what happens? Someone else in the group says, nah, I don't think so. <laughs> so we need, to, we, need to, we need to help each other in understanding books like the book of Revelation. So we've suggested several important lessons. We hope that you follow along here. For one, there's an important connection between the book of Revelation and the Old Testament, especially the book of Daniel. Two, the general structure of the book reminds us of Daniel and helps us to understand how to read it. Three, the entire book focuses on the person of Jesus Christ. And Fred, I think you've got a... No. Uh, Dennis. Dennis, yeah. I'm sorry, Dennis. The book of Revelation could be considered the book... This is from the Adult Teacher's Sabbath School uh, Bible Study Guide. Uh, the book of Revelation could be considered the book of the New Testament closest to the Old Testament. We may count 
count 2,000 allusions to the Old Testament, including 400 explicit references and 90 quotations of the Pentateuch and the Prophets. This book is so anchored in Hebrew that it has been said that it can barely be understood by anyone who isn't proficient in Hebrew. John opens his message to the seven churches with a greeting originating in, uh, originating in the God of the Old Testament. The shalom comes from him who is a phrase that defines the God, of Yah the God Yahweh who reveals himself to Moses uh, at the burning bush. Okay. Well, as we continue to study the time of the end, we will see many relationships between the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. John clearly had in mind also the sanctuaries presented in the Old Testament. God apparently revealed to him these aspects of the sanctuary to do two things. To remind us that God is talking to us about our worship. Isn't that what happens in a sanctuary, hopefully? And two, remind John and us that there are two aspects to Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. So after doing this brief look at the book of Revelation, what would you say is the most important symbol used in the book of Revelation to represent Jesus Christ? Now we haven't near, we haven't come even, we haven't hardly touched all everything that's said in the book of Revelation, so that's probably not a very fair question, but in light of all you experts, what you've read in the book of Revelation before, what would you say is the most prevalent picture of God, or picture of Christ in the New Testament? I mean, in the book of Revelation. There's many. There's the initial one where he's amongst the, the lampstands. There's him as the Lamb of God. Well, he says the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and then he looks and he sees the Lamb, and that motif recurs. And uh, he's the man-child that's born of the woman. Uh, he's the conquering king on the white horse. Yep. Um, and there, I'm sure there's others. Yes. He's represented as a priest. He's represented as a lamb, as you've mentioned. He's rep represented as our savior. Maybe the most common is king. Conqueror over death and sin. Well, as mentioned earlier, in the book of Revelation is full of blood. It seems to represent God as a vengeful God. We know that that is not a correct picture. That was almost certainly part of the reason why Luther, Martin Luther rejected the book of Revelation. So how do you see the book of Revelation? Do you see it as a revelation of Jesus Christ or a terrible picture of God's plan of retribution against sinners? It's your choice. What would you say? Kind and loving Father, we thank you for these, this revelation we have specifically in the book by that name. May it be to us a guide as we study these, this preparation for the end time is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.